Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, you know, we're, we're happy to have you. Um, you know, welcome to Speed Bumps Live. And for those of you that are joining us for the first time, this is a web show that discusses marketing challenges and opportunities um, with leaders from different industries. And uh, we have, uh, we're very fortunate to have a very, very talented, very experienced uh, marketer with us today. And I'll let Paul do the introduction, but I'm Javier Santana, I'm co-founder of Launch. And Launch is an experienced design agency here in Atlanta. Yeah, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm Paul Carpenter, Director of Client Relations at Line Star Films. We're a video production studio focused on branded content and communications. Um, and as Javier said, uh, we are gonna introduce Doug here in a second. Doug, just give us a second for some housekeeping items, okay? Of course. All right, Hob, kick us off with those yeah. housekeeping. Yeah, just quickly wanted to mention that while the chat feature is off, we're gonna be doing Q and A uh, toward the end of the show. So uh, please, as you're thinking of questions when we're having the conversation, just go ahead and put them in. Uh, we're fortunate to have Jen Erdman from USPEC Marketing. She's going to be helping us moderate today. So, uh, you know, thanks again, Jen, for helping us out. And, uh, and then I'll just go ahead and turn it back over to you, Paul. Right on. Hey, listen, everybody, I, I, the guy doesn't need it, any introductions, all right? Uh, but we've got Doug Busk with us here. Uh, he's a fixture in the Atlanta marketing and tech scene. He spent time with Singular, AT&T. When that transition happened, Verizon, uh, you know, even going back to the late 90s where he actually shared, apparently shared a closet with one of my other colleagues. If uh, John Witte, if you're on there listening, what's up, John? Uh, this is back at the old Cox Interactive days. So, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty funny, small world stuff. Uh, but Doug also led communication strategies at Coca-Cola that included everything digital, mobile, social, um, before taking his expertise over to another uh, Atlanta brand here, Emory University, where he's VP of Enterprise Communications and Marketing. That is a mouthful and quite a resume. And I really, before we go into a little bit of the, the background here too, um, I really want to talk, uh, uh, I want to kind of kick it off, and we didn't talk about this the other day, but one of the conversations you and I had, Doug, uh, back in September of last year was that intersection of brand and higher ed, and, and those two aren't usually associated or mentioned, and so I kind of want to just kick it off there and kind of start with your approach as you entered Emory. Sure. Uh, well, well, first of all, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for the invitation uh, and, and Jennifer as well. I'm um, honored to be here. Uh, you know, a speaking opportunity from my sunroom. This is a first, hasn't happened yet. So it's my pleasure to be here. And thank you, everybody, for dialing in. Uh, I hope I give you something slightly more entertaining. Um, if, it, if, if I don't, uh, by the way, I'll invite my precocious six-year-old Naomi to come in here and provide it for you. Listen, the bar is low, man. Between Hob and I, <laughs> that, you're going to be very, you're going to be very entertaining. Yeah. TikTok dance is welcome, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was my very crafty way of expect either technical interruption or my daughter's interruption at some point. Um, so I hope everybody is doing well and getting through um, the stay at home phase. I can say from the healthcare side of our work at Emory, please continue to do that. Um, and thank you. Uh, on behalf of uh, Atlanta, all of your neighbors uh, and your extended family in Atlanta for doing so. Um, it's exciting to be here uh, to, to answer the question directly, um, that intersection of uh, brand and uh, institution, which is really what a lot of schools of higher ed refer to themselves as. Um, I was attracted to the possibility to be a part of the team at Emory, uh, which by the way, I should say is my alma mater. Um, before I was sharing, I believe it was a server closet uh, with John Witte at Sim yeah. Studio at Cox Interactive Media. Um, I, uh, you know, went to college at Emory. and was a poli sci major. Um, I was uh, excited at the chance to be there because uh, the folks who recruited me, um, Claire Sturck, who's the um, now outgoing but um, current president of the university, and David Sandor, who's my boss, who's the head of communications writ large for the university. Um, really sort of took me up on my offer to burnish the brand of Emory through quality storytelling. And it's much of the same storytelling that many of you do in your day jobs every day. Um, and by the way, many of us do uh, at night on you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, you name it. Um, you know, really taking these incredible 
human and incredibly human uh, stories that happen inside of a, a, a leading school like Emory every day and bringing it to the outside world. Making sure that people understand uh, Emory is not simply in Atlanta, it is of Atlanta. Uh, we've grown up uh, literally uh, with the city um, and have been here nearly as long, um, depending on which version of the history you look at, almost longer. Um, opening up our doors digitally and uh, physically to uh, the community. And we can talk a little bit later about how that's challenged by COVID uh, and everything that's happened since then. I had no idea going in that I would be able to tell incredible stories uh, around our research as well on that note. Um, but there's an entirely um, you know, uh, separate and thriving track around health sciences research at Emory as well. Um, so COVID has provided us the opportunity to tell those stories of truth and fact and science uh, in a time when I think all of us can agree we need more of that, uh, but also gratitude, gratitude for our frontline workers, everyone from healthcare to the cleaning teams to uh, nursing staff. Um, and that's been uh, amazing. It's, it's, it's just been brilliant to watch both our scientists telling those stories of real information and getting that information out there, as well as um, stories of uh, thanks and gratitude. Um, so we can dig into that more later, but what we talked about in September remains the case. Um, what is the value of education? What does it mean to be an educational brand? And uh, when I asked around, I asked folks who were already in the higher ed sector or, or had consulted in it previously uh, before I went and interviewed for the role, and they all warned me. They said, "Don't, don't refer to Emory as, uh, as a brand. You're a brand guy. You came out of Coke and Verizon and Singular. It, that's the stories you're used to telling. But, but they're not a brand." I said, "What do you mean? Like, of course, they're a brand. You know, students select it based on being a brand. Parents encourage their students to go there based on its brand value." And they said, "No, no, it's an institution." And I'll be frank in saying, I, I don't buy that. If you're making a commitment to anything. Uh, either at the level that many of Emory's parents do or the students, you're building an association with that brand that hopefully is a lifetime association. So I view that not as a negative, but as a positive. And that's really what uh, my team and I have been trying to do since I joined uh, in 2018. That's awesome. I mean, that's that's a lot. <clears throat> and uh, we're we're in this interesting situation now with COVID. And while we try not to, to do a lot of uh, COVID topics, or at least that's not where we're going, I think that this is really instrumental for us to talk about how this affects um, Emory Higher Ed as a whole. You know, you said something, uh, I actually quoted you and I sent that out. You said, if higher ed faced challenges before, uh, it faces a tsunami in, what, in what's today and what will be tomorrow's reality, um, never has it been more important for schools to connect and create communities outside the reaches of campuses, right? Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on some of those challenges that you've seen pre-COVID um, when you really talked about, you know, some, you know, uh, higher education as a whole, but also um, when you start thinking about physical, digital, the value of attendance, um, how does that really play into your, your short-term strategy? Because we're still trying to figure it out. And then obviously going into more long-term. Sure. I'll, I'll sort of subtract, uh, you know, Emory specifically from this to talk about the challenges that I think higher education is facing in the States um, and has in the U.S. and has for some time. Uh, and then we can circle back to, you know, what Emory is doing about those challenges from my perspective. But to start from the challenges that face the sector, um, everybody has seen the statistics of the rising cost of tuition and how that is or isn't tracking with inflation. Um, that's pretty much across the board, private, uh, not-for-profit, and state-based schools, public schools, if you will, have all faced the same challenge. Um, uh, you know, as uh, budgets have been lowered on the state level and even the federal level uh, around grants, it's become that much more expensive to send students to schools. Uh, we're lucky in Georgia to have the HOPE Scholarship and other financial support. These things do help, but at the end of the day, we recognize that. Um, you know, I think the sector has recognized that the, the level of, you know, what you might call the, the full tuition, um, you know, or the full freight tuition is, um, you know, up and to the right in just about every chart you look at. So there have been and are and continue to be rightfully a lot of questions around the ROI, um, you know, for tuition for just about any school of higher education. Um, uh, particularly in the U.S., and that uh, naturally leads with the accompanying challenges uh, around student debt. You know, graduates coming out of the you know into the working world, 
with whatever degree or degrees they have, having to struggle to pay off this, um, you know, this debt they might have accumulated while while they're there. And so these were just some of the challenges facing, you know, schools of higher education. And then there's a question of the the validity of the education itself and its applicability to the working market. This is not a new topic area. Uh, there has been uh, effectively since the establishment of the major or liberal arts as a discipline questions of its applicability. But what we're finding is that um, even employers that were previously looking for hyper-professional technical degrees, uh, you, you know, just five years ago, a Google, a Facebook, if you will, are now saying, you know what, we actually need more problem solving. We have lots of specialists coming out of schools or have lots of specialists coming to us, but what we need is problem solving. What we need is um, uh, a sense of, of uh, sort of resilience and how to put things together to solve challenges that face society at large. And that lends itself to a lot of liberal arts. It lends itself to philosophy. It lends itself to history. It lends itself to political science. How did humans um, you know, overcome these challenges previously, um, which, not, you know, which doesn't necessarily work to the exclusion of a more technical or say an engineering degree. It just means that a lot of employers are beginning to recognize the power of problem solving and um, frankly, uh, you know, resilience. Uh, so, um, all of those challenges, you know, the ROI of uh, liberal arts education, the, the, you know, the cost of going to your average higher education institution, um, you know, the, the questions of, um, you know, what am I getting out of this on-campus experience? Why wouldn't I just do this online? That last one sort of springboards into, you know, a massive challenge when you have something like COVID, where because of social distance, uh, before we have a vaccine, hopefully one is coming soon, um, we can't be around each other. We can't have, you know, more than 10, 10 folks in a room or we should advisedly be, you know, six feet apart at all times. I don't know what your college experience was. If you, if you went to one, uh, there were a lot of less than six feet uh, apart in my college experience. And I think that's, you know, you look at any sort of, you know, uh, first year symposium, you might have hundreds of students packed into uh, a lecture hall what does the higher education experience, what does the campus experience turn into um, when that isn't the case? So that's what I mean by a lot of these challenges that were sort of on the event horizon coming a heck of a lot closer. Right. And so what I felt as a brand marketer is that, uh, you know, upon arrival, you know, just over a year and a half ago, is I could feel the, the tide pulling out. I could feel the water pulling out from the beach on this, you know, in this segment. And that means that there's a wave coming. It was just a question of how big it is. And I think COVID has made that wave simply a lot larger. So it's, uh, you know, we and the rest of higher ed are facing um, some tremendous challenges, but so too is travel. So too is, you know, restaurant right. business. I mean, we're not alone in that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, something that we're kind of leaning into here um, in talking about the, difference between that physical space or physical physicality, if you will, of being on campus um, versus more of the transactional, almost commoditized uh, learning via online uh, that kind of seems to be a breaking point across the board. It's not just uh, higher education or institution. It, it's, it's really across the board, almost, almost as you are are talking about retail and e-com and you know the the digital transformation topics left and right. Sure. Um, what what can you touch on a little bit of some of the approaches you're doing to kind of help keep the experience as personalized as possible with Emory? Yeah, I think uh, Emory has a superlative tradition of of transparency, and that's the uh, that's the first thing we did in this communications you know process around particularly COVID um, was being very clear from the start. This is under the leadership of a colleague of mine, Nancy Seidemann, who's been working with the Office of the Provost primarily on this. Um, you know. What is happening? When can students come back? How are they going to be taught? What does distance learning look like? Um, we over-indexed uh, in, in many ways on that information because we feel that's the that's the least we can do for our students um, to apply it to other segments, if I can for a moment, if that's sort of the direction of your question. 
Um, you know, I think those segments and those leaders who have uh, done well in this environment have done so because they followed the same over-indexing on transparency. There's a reason why people are attracted to Governor Cuomo's briefings and not necessarily the briefings of other leaders we might mention, um, because he's very frank. He's very clear. He always makes sure when an unknown is an unknown, he simply says, we don't know. Um, you know, uh, when you look at uh, Ed Bastian, a pick a leader in Atlanta with Delta Airlines, um, they have been very upfront. They've been very transparent. They've, uh, you know, again, they've had full on emails that said a little more than uh, we're with you. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know when flying is going to get back to the way it was. Um, so I think that transparency is one of those lessons for crisis communications that should just be there. Um, front and center, but I, but I, I think what has distinguished leaders in this environment is those that have um, really focused on the known knowns and the and the known unknowns, if you will, um, and have said when they don't know uh, when there's going to be an answer to something, um, or said we will get back to you by this date, and so that's something that uh, Nancy and her work and. Uh, also on my team, Laura Douglas Brown and Susan Channa and their work on Emory.edu and uh, our earned media, respectively, have reinforced. We want to bring experts forward that are going to lean into that level of transparency um, because people need and deserve answers and they are capable of hearing when that answer is, we don't know right now. I also think this is why there's been such a groundswell of support for Dr. Fauci. Um, here is somebody who who has experienced enough with a, enough variabilities when it comes to infectious disease in his career that it is in his DNA to be very clear about what he knows and what he doesn't know. Um, and so I think that's reflected in, in public support for him. Yeah. Um, and and let's let's remove crisis from sure. from the situation for a little bit and 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 still stay on this subject, but. Again, if 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 we remove crisis um, altogether, uh, where I'm kind of leaning into here is just that almost that dichotomy between hey, I can go and get my my education online. It might not be as personalized. It's kind of like you know just go 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 and get it versus the on campus almost physicality. And the, you know, what, what you and I have talked about before, the power of place. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Sure. I, I think one of the things, um, and, and this is sort of the path we were exploring, and I think is worthy for us to spend a little bit more time on today is, you, you know, I think a lot of what we're dealing with right now is there's two, two macro themes that occur to me from a societal perspective. Number one, um, the challenge facing us, and none of us, uh, well, many of us, most of us have not seen this in our lifetimes, fortunately. Uh, the challenge of, of, of a contagious disease like, uh, like, coronavirus, like COVID and coronavirus that spreads it is instantly we have to transform a particularly American perspective around individualism to pluralism. I mean, think about social distance in and of itself. The very idea that we're wearing a mask, the very idea that I am going to go out and be conscious and cognizant of people who are six feet away means that I'm taken away from my phone and my experience, and what's going on in my day, to look around me and make sure that I am not within six feet and you are not within six feet. That in and of itself is a pluralistic approach. The second theme, the power of place, influences and plays off of that theme of individualism um, because as, and again, this is a very American thing. We associate many of our memories with the actual place we're in, but we also do a ton of our socialization through those environments. And on that note, I think that's, that would be a shame to lose in whatever transformation occurs, not only on campuses, you know, schools, but in corporations, that we need to take this time to examine what really should be done and needs to be done together and value that time more as opposed to what can and should be done and could be done remotely and treat that work accordingly. I think it would be a shame if we went from one edge of the, of the horizon to a completely different edge, which was, uh, you know, all work from home, you know, all work in the office. Um, there's value to considering which can be done where and answering directly to, to the campus situation, much of the growth that occurs in a 
school of higher education, undergraduate or graduate, is in the experience, is in the connection with your fellow classmates, with the other students, with teaching assistants, with teachers, with staff. They are truly special places. So the challenge facing us, but also the challenge facing any major company, whether you're 15 people or 15,000, is how do we make the time together more valuable? How do we appreciate that more? And how do we respectfully offer time and space back when it isn't truly needed? Um, get those and get those cars off the road, get that stressors away. Um, this is not a typical time, but we would be doing ourselves a disservice to recognize what should be typical out of it. Yeah, awesome. Well, that's interesting. Let me ask this question, right? Because there is a, a need, um, psychological need to be physically close to each other, right? And I think in, in our industry, we, we're constantly being inspired by each other. But, you know, now there's this whole generation that has this, they've normalized what is this distant learning, so to speak. And I'll give you the example of uh, a friend of, of ours that she teaches special needs in first grade. And she's actually mm -hmm. having Zoom classes with these children, very young age. So it's amazing. So, right. So it's one of those things where we've done it out of, out of being creative because we don't have a choice. But now when we really start thinking about what is the future of it, right? So when you really start thinking about, and this applies to pretty much everything in every industry across the way, um, the ability to connect and create experiences for businesses that are more meaningful, right? Like you start to mention, how do businesses do that? When we have a generation that is now getting accustomed to this being the normal. I wake up, I'm in front of a screen. You know, it's kind of like that whole uh, uh, mm -hmm. the Pixar Wally thing where you're just kind of floating around in a chair with screens all the way around and you're just interacting left and right. So how do we, how do we get, what is, what is the evolution of, of that? And I, by no means do I think that you're going to have the proper answer. I'm just curious to, uh, to the way that you see it in your mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly am not, you know, any one of the behavioral experts that, you know, we're lucky to have at Emory who are, you know, proper, you know, have proper research degrees in this in this area. But um, I can say that I share your same concerns. We already had a challenge with isolation, um, the way that, you know, our digital lives have empowered it, enabled it, and in many ways made it addictive. Um, uh, you know, so we... Uh, we should take some time looking at this experience and considering, you know, the mental health impacts of that and the importance of in-person, you know, communication, in-person experiences, whether that's simply brainstorming in an office or getting back on a, you know, getting back to campuses. Um, like I said, it, it, I think, again, we're doing sort of our shared evolution of disservice. We go from one extreme to the other of, you know, okay, everybody's worked from home. Mm -hmm. Nobody's, you know, in shared spaces. Um, and if nobody was in shared spaces, I think you would look at an acceleration of many of those mental health challenges. Um, so that is, you know, I think sort of a dark road to go down or just to sort of like, if you will, sort of sleepwalk into it because we haven't asked the hard questions as to what really should be done in person and what shouldn't be done in person. Um, just looking at video calling as an example, I know we're on Zoom and it's great that Zoom and Skype and, you know, Google Hangouts and all these other tools are available to us. Um, but there's been several studies already that have suggested that the reason you might be exhausted after four or five Zoom calls on a row, if you're lucky enough to be in a career that that is that is now your day job, and I say that sincerely because there are many of us who are on the front lines, um, in you know in grocery stores and hospitals, as I mentioned, and elsewhere. But if you're in one of these roles that allows you to be on Zoom calls all day, you might be exhausted at the end of it because your brain is actually doing overtime, according to these studies trying to interpret the micro moments, expressions, and even pheromones that aren't available to you. So the brain sees uh, a human face and is going to want to engage with it in the level that it thinks it's actually at, which is inches away, not miles away, as we probably, as I'm sure we are in this circumstance. And as a result, that virtual facsimile of a human exhausts um, you know, our cognitive processes. Um, so for example, I've you know, taken that to heart. I try to move as many of my Zoom calls to standard conference calls because the brain handles the, the, the audio processing better than it does the full visual experience with audio. Um, so uh, I don't know whether distance learning um, should stop necessarily at Zoom and the sort of two-dimensional experience, or will many classes be benefited by an AR or VR approach to borrow a page from my mobile background? Um, will we wear, be wearing goggles and have some approximation of, a, of an experience? I can see areas like CAD and design that will be greatly helped with that right out of the gate. But would you add VR for 
um, you know, other in-person experiences, uh, I don't know. I think it's something we're going to have to explore. I think a lot of the experience we've had thus far, both as, you know, coworkers and higher ed has been, frankly, the tools we had available. And in some cases, it's, you know, sort of bailing wire and duct tape, uh, you know, to get to, okay, let's just get to the end of this semester or let's get to the end of this month. Um, I think most people, most parents, most students, many, you know, office mates would say the same thing, teammates, this isn't ideal. There has to be something else we, we can do. Yeah. You don't have a box of old sci-fi DVDs. I'm sure we could find the answer in there somewhere. Somebody mm. figured it out. For sure. Yeah, some somewhere between somewhere between Blade Runner and and Max Headroom twenty minutes into the future. <laughs> Max Headroom for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So speaking of Max Headroom, um, <laughs> it's a perfect segue um, because that takes us back to all you know to pre mobile, right? I mean, yeah. it, in your your experience in mobile, um, almost the early days. Uh, you know, was was a more of a almost like a utility in in a way, but now mm -hmm. it's it's just so uh, it's so needed. And and I know you've talked about you know it's the fourth screen. You remember when it was the third screen, and now it's the window to the world. Um, can you talk a little bit about like your approaches and strategies and even background um, that that can help kind of be that bridge for communication and messaging, especially in the in the education space where, you know, we're 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 working with and we're targeting kids. Um, you know, and, and what does that look like today versus what does it look like tomorrow? Right. I, you know, I think again, this is one of those classic examples of um, you know be thankful for the tools you have available when we're all, you know, stay at home and, and then immediately question whether we should be leaning on them as much as we are. As we do. Um, you know, I've been in the mobile business, as you said, long enough to remember when it was the fourth screen, the third screen, now it's the only screen. Um, I, I dread my weekly screen time report, which magically comes up to destroy my Sunday morning. I got to figure out how to change that, <laughs> that setting. Um, and having and having played, you know, a small part in, in making it such an omnipresent part in our lives, where I've gone is to mindful mobile. Um, you know, how do we curate, uh, manage down these tools to where it, they are tools, and rather than um, you know us, uh, rather than us being told by them what to do, we tell them what to do, and they serve a specific function for that period of time. There is way too much science behind um, the algorithms of, you know, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, to keep you there, um, you know, take your pick. You know, I sort of like the casino example, the constant sort of um, slot machine effect of, you know, swipe up or swipe right or whatever you might be using. So I think there is a mindfulness we need to apply to this um, to get to the point where again, the time we do spend on it is truly a value. And it's not dissimilar to the power of place that I mentioned earlier. Be purposeful about being in this place. Don't be in two places at the same time. And trust me, I knew I do know better on this than anyone else. I just happen to have a little bit more time around the technology uh, than some. Um, be purposeful about your use of the phone. Be purposeful about your use of the tool. Um, uh, now, all that said, let's give ourselves a little bit of grace have an extra pop tart, you know, cook that meatloaf and stick on Facebook a little bit longer if it's going to keep you sane right now. No problem with that. Um, but, you know, really do look at what that activity might be taking you away from doing otherwise. Um, you know, I sit out on my front porch, as I'm sure many of you do, to, to get my work done in many days. And it thrills me to see the number of people, my neighbors who are out for daily walks, many of them together. Um, not on a phone, not some of them doing conference calls, but usually when they're together, they're actually talking. And that draws, I draw a lot of inspiration from that. Um, so I think that many things may change out of this. And one of the silver linings out of this process could be, you know what, I know what I need Facebook for. I know what I need Twitter for. I know the power it offers me to connect with people. Um, maybe you even reconnected with people you haven't talked to in a long time. I have talked to several people in just the last two weeks, um, around 10 of them 
that I haven't talked to in nearly five years, some of them longer than 10 years. Um, and so if mobile brings that to you, that's a positive benefit. Um, if it, if it, if it prompts you to do that even better. So, um, you know, I think there's a risk that we lean too much into these worlds. Um, but again, make a list of the great things you can take from it and try to act on that or maybe return to it after this, after we're through this phase. That's awesome. Um, let's do, uh, let's ask a couple more and then we'll hand it over to Jen. But uh, really quickly, you mentioned desperation drives innovation, right? We had a pretty long conversation about mm -hmm. that. Um, has there been anything based on you know si the situation or based on the way that technology is shifting that has made you think a little bit differently um, about anything that you're doing either now or just previously? And what lessons would you pass on to other marketers across all industries? Yeah, I, I try to analyze a uh, focus group of one, but I try to analyze what has changed in my world, starting from from my home to what I need to do for my family and then moving outside from my home and what may change uh, when things, quote unquote, return to normal. Uh, and, uh, you know, I look at things like retail, um, the number of times that I've gone for curbside pickup at a Kroger or a Publix or a, um, a Target primarily that I haven't before. Um, I have worked to, uh, to, to find out what I can do through curbside. What can I move off of Amazon into a Target purchase? Because it turns out, lo and behold, I could get it at my local Target. I could get it delivered directly to my car. I don't need to have you know, a, an Amazon truck deliver it out of their warehouse to my front door. That, that helps with social distancing. It helps spread out you know, our, our little family spend a little bit further. I think a lot of folks are going through that experience now. So I think in the space of retail and groceries, um, there are going to be a ton of people who come out of this experience and say, you know what, Instacart delivery is perfectly fine for me. Or I had no idea I could do this curbside at Target. I think restaurants will change as well. The number of people who found out they could do takeout or uh, frankly, the number of people figured out they could go off menu with their takeout because yeah. so many restaurateurs have been incredibly innovative and in, you know, the new items they're offering. Um, I also think that the gathering space, the dine-in experience is going to be, unfortunately, for many of those re restaurateurs, um, much more limited. I think there will be entire brands moving forward that may primarily or only exist as pickup or delivery. Um, so that's borrowing a page from my experience at Coca-Cola. I have to imagine those economics are being looked at very closely by every chain out there right now. Um, does it make sense to have a standalone restaurant that only serves one brand? Why, didn't, why wouldn't you have a kitchen that serves you know, four or five brands with just different windows around the building? Um, so I expect those things to change as well. Um, hospitality and travel, uh, that's, that entire segment is... Um, going to be incredibly challenged. Um, is the hotel clean? Is the cruise ship clean? What, what happens if I'm out on the cruise ship when something like this it goes down? Um, so those are segments that are going to see, you know, wild change. And I, uh, I have lots of friends who are marketers in those spaces. And um, some of them have been very creative. I've uh, I got to give a shout out, by the way, for transparency while we're on this topic. If you haven't read it, do uh, read the memo that the CEO of Airbnb, um, uh, Chesnick, sent out to his team about their cuts. Man, it was just a, a you know a case study and transparency around what he's doing, how he's doing it, what will happen to those who are impacted. Um, but that's just one example of many in, in travel as, as to how things will change. And I think in the near term, certainly in the pre-vaccine environment, um, you're going to see uh, you know much more local travel, people driving to their destinations going to places they know, uh, maybe visiting with family or going to that timeshare they know that, you know, that their aunt might have, have available or going to visit their grandparents. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot more people doing road than air travel, at least in the, in the near term, just to name one, one example. Well, the good thing is that now we don't have those big paper maps and dad's not there circling shit on a map. Trying to get the <laughs> location. So that's yeah, yeah, dude, I missed the trip tick. Yeah. The trip tick was awesome. <laughs> Triple A trip tick. <laughs> Hey, real quick, everybody who's listening, uh, real quick, remember we do have a Q&A module at the bottom. Ask some questions. Uh, I know Doug will have plenty of answers. Um, and and that's, a, that, that's a compliment. Um, one quick thing. 
uh, before we do go to Q&A, I have, you've got to tell this granola bar thing. It, I really think like it, 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 it really encapsulated a lot for me when we were talking yeah. about that shift that, 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 that the environment is having right now with brands and loyalty. And, and I've heard, I've heard numerous uh, points of view on this where brand loyalty will be the highest. People will want to go back to the, tri, you know, the trusted brand that they grew up with. And then I've heard the other side of the, the fence, which is, well, now this is an opportunity to explore some of those almost direct to consumer brands where we're getting interrupted with, you know, ads and Instagram all the time going, I yeah. didn't know I could get that. Can you talk about that? That was, a, it was yeah, awesome. I, yeah, I think D2C brands have a singular uh, opportunity to, to get a piece of mind share they may never have been able to before. Um, I think private label and house brands have a singular opportunity to break through in a way they did before. Um, and for me, it goes from, you know, baby aspirin to granola bars. Um, back in the day when baby aspirin was actually recommended for fat guys like myself, it isn't anymore, as it turns out. But, um, you know, I flipped from, I was, a, I was a bear aspirin guy. I came from a bear aspirin family. We were also a P&G family. And, you know, Robitussin and Sudafed could solve all. I could name all the brands that were in our pantry. Um, and that's true. Robitussin and Sudafed, man. I mean, yeah. you know, a little surprise, surprise, elbow and, and then you're good. <laughs> Surprise! The president hasn't gotten around to suggesting those yet. Because uh, when I was a kid, they solved everything apparently. Um, and so our, you know, our brand associations come from moments like this. And as as my wife Cindy pointed out at one point, she's like, "Why did you move from Bear? When did you move from Bear to Target brand for baby aspirin?" And I said, "You know, I thought about it. And it was the 2009 recession. You know, that's when Target started rolling out a lot of its up and up. You know, which is their house brand stuff." And I was like, "I tried it. it. Didn't make any difference. I'm like, it's one quarter the price. It's the generic. I'm just going to go with that." We're going to see the same thing happen in this environment in one of two ways. The path to purchase is being broken because of panic buying, because of curbside, because of delivery. People are being either a lot more rushed if they're trying to get in and out of the store. They just need to get what they need to get. And, and in that case, if look, if Bounty isn't there, they're going to take the Target brand paper towel. That is happening. Um, you know, if there's sanitizer or anything, they're just grabbing that and they're trying all sorts of different brands and D to C brands that really had to be creative about how they got to you through convenience. And the example we talked about is uh, verb uh, V E R B, which is a energy bar brand. I found out about through Axios. I read Axios newsletters, you know, religiously they marketed in there. They had a very smart play where it was $4 to try out their bars. I did so. I was delighted with their buying experience. It was all Apple Pay. It was automated through text. They have an approachable texting process. They put you on a monthly subscription and then let you know um, in advance of when they're going to ship it. You can change it out via text. It's fun. It's approachable. You have total control. It is one of the few brands that was sort of that I signed up for, um, you know, pre-COVID, pre-crisis, if you will, that I've been delighted to see through the crisis. They're donating a, a ton of their bars to. Um, you know, healthcare and other frontline team members, um, which of course I love. So I'm, you know, I've, you've gained a loyal customer through not only their approach and their convenience, but that has also probably reduced what other bars I might have bought in a store. And I am finding myself trying a lot of private label and house label brands that I wouldn't have otherwise, either because of out of stocks or because it's like, look, I got to get in and out of here. I'm not going to debate which version of celery hearts I'm getting. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, see, I I told you, I told everybody like it so smart and it, and it, and it just really, when we talked the other day, uh, that, that just kind of brought it all home and it kind of wrapped it all up for me in a way that, um, I haven't heard explained before. And I, I like yeah, and another world. indicator I would, I would look yeah. at, I, I, I read this in a, in a reputable source and I can, I can send the note around afterwards. Uh, I understand that AT&T has seen uh, over, saw over 900,000 UVerse TV subscribers drop service in the first month of the crisis. And if, if that turns out to be the case, that is a stunning number of, of people who are cable cutting. And that means in every single one of their homes, they're looking at their subscription costs and they're saying, what can I get by with? And when you have like Pluto TV and Sling TV and yeah. YouTube TV, they're looking at these options, none of which or most of which don't have a contract at all. They're like, it's good enough. If I put that together with Netflix and my MLB subscription, I'm good to go. So I think we're going to see 
many brands suffer what I call the blockbuster effect, where blockbuster lasted a solid five to six years longer than it should have, mainly owing to easy credit and hyper overpriced microwave popcorn that made the whole place smell, in my opinion, absolutely horrendous. There's a particular scent to those blockbusters. Um, and, and you wondered why they managed to stay around, and that was because of easy credit. I think we're going to see a similar uh, seismic shift for a lot of brands and sectors in this space, and I wouldn't be surprised if OTT and cutting the cord isn't one of those. Yeah, awesome, awesome, really good info. Uh, hey, Jen, you, you're there? You're on mute, Jen. Like Vanna are. White, I appear. How are come you? On, <laughs> yeah, come on in. Jen from USPEC, everybody. Uh, we'll let you uh, go through yeah. a few questions from the attendees. Anything yeah, you have to ask. And I added a couple wild cards myself. Love it. Um, so, Doug, thank you so much. That was really helpful. We had a couple of questions come in. Um, one of the first ones is, um, you know, everyone is enjoying the talk, the, coming through the comments. Um, but one of the questions is, what specifically as a marketer are you doing to adjust during these times? And who else or companies have you seen doing marketing well during these odd and strange times? Uh, so there's a there's a common theme between those two, and thank you thank you for the question. Since I'm getting to the questions now, I'm going to move to my my diet coke. <laughs> take, take, you can take the guy out of Coca Cola. I can't take Coca Cola out Product of product placement. <laughs> mm. um, so uh, uh, the common theme between those two areas is transparency. I think that um, you know what we've tried to do at Emory um, from a brand storytelling perspective if, if you will is lean on transparency and pretty early uh, on in the process many of us I know I did felt like we were sort of the lighthouse managers we could see that wave coming in um, because we were tracking on this thanks to our research side from fairly early on I think I went and looked at my archives and the first mention of it in my email was like late December um, so it was starting to pop up. Uh, no, I did not buy extra hand sanitizer. No, I did not buy extra toilet paper. I was busy running the, the, my section of the lighthouse. Um, that's often what happens. So we decided early on that we were going to go for sort of myth busting style posts. You know, why do you need a face mask? When would you use it? Please don't deplete the face mask supply from those who do want it as we started to get into more of the panic buying phase. Um, and then we moved very quickly into what is COVID, what is coronavirus? And then um, as a lot of the metrics started coming in from the federal and state uh, governments, we felt that our, our best place to be was instead of what's now, what's next? Yeah. So what will working be like? What will school be like? What will it be like to travel? So we've attempted to balance our coverage out with, uh, you know, on the research side with as much of those sort of economics questions of workplace or even behavioral questions. because We've got a big focus on mental health on that side, all with the interest of having the most transparent science fact based information we can get there, get out there, whether it's on Fox or on Facebook. We want to make sure that you can find fact based information from our leading researchers, scientists, teachers, and students, um, and designed to get at the students and staff and you know everyone else in the world. Uh, I think that as a marketer, I've been attracted to those leaders, like I mentioned, you know, Delta as an example, Governor Cuomo up in New York, that have leaned in on um, what I would say is really aggressive vulnerability, um, truly expressive empathy. Uh, if you don't know much about Governor Cuomo's background, I encourage you to look into the 1979 mayoral race, um, where, wherein he was, he really cut his teeth running, helping run his dad's campaign, uh, Mario Cuomo. Um, Andrew Cuomo is not known as a softie. Um, so it's rather spectacular that in a lot of his press conferences, he has always returned to how hard this is and how much he's asking of people. So I've been attracted to that style of leadership. I've tried to imbue that leadership with my team. And as a marketer, that's what I've tried to do and what I'm attracted to. So like I said, Airbnb is just one example this week, but they're all over the place. Great answer. Transparency is important, right? Especially in communication, and setting expectations. So thank and, you. And um, being transparently human. I, yeah. Absolutely. That absolutely. I think vulnerability is interesting too, because that is a, I think from a brand perspective as a marketer myself, it makes you relatable, right? So that's yes. exciting. And thank you. So another question, what are some of the positive um, systematic changes you hope to see in higher education as a result of this crisis? 
Um, you know, we've touched on a couple of them. I think, uh, first of all, is understanding value understanding the value of higher education, understanding the value of being on campus, a greater focus on engaging in the real world, um, really appreciating presence, being present, not being on many screens. And it is up to us, frankly, on the staff and faculty side to make our engagement and to make our environments that compelling, compelling enough to put the phone down or compelling enough to um, have the iPad or tablet be an extension of the experience rather than the experience we're always in. Um, I, I, I hope that's what ends up coming out of this across the board. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of one of my personal goals for the work we do at Emory. Awesome. Uh, great answer. So I'm going to not put so much. I have a question for you. Um, and I'm not going to put the spotlight on COVID because why shine a spotlight on it anymore? Um, but I do have a question. You you kind of alluded to it, um, and for those listening, um, Doug and I realized that we both uh, may have crossed paths in our telco careers previously, um, and you mentioned it when you mentioned UVerse being a former at and um, and mm -hmm. the cord cutters and the cord nevers. So as you mentioned, like, what, the question I want to know is, what do you think the next big thing in marketing is? Like, you know, we when digital first launched or social people like that'll never take off and look what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I vividly remember in my days at Verizon when I launched SMS, I had a president tell me that would never take off and no one will ever want a text message. Ha ha ha. I wonder where he is now. Um, <laughs> was, that, was, that, was that President Jim Strait? Um, curbsiding your target delivery. I'm just kidding. He was a lovely man. Um, but, um, you know, what do you think? You mentioned OTT. Tell me what your your experience as a marketer coming from great brands like Coca-Cola and AT&T, these blue chips. Tell me what you think your gut, you would lean into what the next big thing is. Uh, you know, I think those brands that um, understand it's about the right message uh, at the right time over the right medium um, and leverage those paths um, skillfully are going to win. You know, taking the example of the Verb Energy Bars I mentioned earlier, uh, I appreciate that they come to me via plain vanilla text. I appreciate that they have a fun voice when they do it. I can tell exactly when there's a bot responding and just confirming that your order is out the door. And when they had to hold and wait until an actual human could look at, you know, whatever question I was trying to flummox them with and actually respond to it. Um, so I think it is really about the power of personalization with respect for the platform. Um, we have lots of inputs today. I think many of us uh, would benefit from a data diet, uh, from moving away from some of those inputs. Mm -hmm. And I think therefore the bar is that much higher for marketers to personalize their experience. I think there's enormous challenges for uh, anybody who's you know, a mainliner or, or a traditional brand, if you will, marketer today, um, because how do you personalize the experience when so much of the buying experience is out of your hands when it sits you know, on Amazon or it sits on a shelf at Costco? Um, and so, you know, there's a special challenge for major CPG brands um, out there, but there are always opportunities to be in the right place in the right time, rather than intrusive or spooky and creepy. Um, and I think along those lines, there are going to be many, many more um, tunneling apps and VPN apps and, you know, you know security controls over um, folks experience because I think a lot of people are looking at their experience at home and thinking, Okay, my Wi-Fi setup isn't very good. You know, maybe it's insecure. Maybe I should change the password from password. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of thought going into that right now. That's sort of where I, I springboarded off on the OTT side. People are sitting at home and looking at their subscriptions and thinking, okay, time is time is now to to tighten the belt. Um, whether uh, an MSO is going to be able to keep you is is whether they can personalize that response. So, if I were to call AT&T right now, I'd be interested to hear what they're their counter is and, and how they engage with me. That's awesome. And thank you very much. And I think that's, I like the, the intersection of like be, between being creepy, like how do they know so much about me versus right. offering something that would help me. Um, it's right. a little disturbing that you verbalize something in your home and all of a sudden it's in your feed and you're like, can you tell me where my car keys are too? If you're listening, that would be yeah, helpful. It's, yeah. The, the, the one algorithm that's got me is YouTube and it's really freaky. It, 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 it's, it's like, they must be listening to me at some point. It is though. But I mean, I like what you're saying about as a marketer, uh, we are inundated and we're pounded. Like, how do you find the balance? So I do think right time, right place and planning are very good intersections for us to be mindful. Uh, and I think 
not being afraid to be simple is okay. You don't always have to be over the top, right? Right, and I think I, I think the intersection between between you know privacy and premium. I don't really mind it if something is a little creepy as long as it provides me a premium experience in return. Many people are beginning to realize their data sovereignty and the value of the information they supply up to a Facebook, a Twitter, an Instagram, et cetera, and are saying to brands, look, you have access to this data, so put it together in a way that, that makes my experience more premium, and I'm going to reward that. Awesome. Um, I think I have one other question. I'm not sure if it's a question or not, but is, is someone's asking for the spelling of the granola bar, is the brand, I think. Is that what, the, I think that was a question yeah. that came in. Yeah, I, actually, I'll, I will I will confirm it. Um, <laughs> we'll get them as a sponsor for next week's um, yeah, yeah. theory. Verb kidding. Energy, V-E-R-B. And their, uh, their URL is, because um, I was just there, yep, verbenergy.co, verbenergy.co. Highly awesome. recommend the, the ginger snap flavor. Well, thank you, Doug. Those are the questions that I have. I had some of my own, but I just sent you a little note. We'll chat later. So that's all awesome. I have, gentlemen. Yeah. Let me know if you need anything else, but I thank you for your time. It was great. Yeah, no, thanks, Jen. Really appreciate it. Um, and real quick, Doug, we're going to let you get back to your uh, regular schedule program here. Um, yeah, I've got some Mother's Day gifts to go pick up. Yeah, yeah. Well, shh, shh, shh it's a secret. Um, <laughs> Really, thanks for joining us. Also, I want everybody to, to you know, thank everybody for joining us as well. And I want you to stay tuned for next week and see if uh, Javier and I wear the same shirt along with our guest. Um, it seems to be a, uh, it seems to be something. So uh, yeah, stick around next week, see if we're wearing the same kind of uh, collage here. Uh, and we are gonna put this show up on YouTube again. And we're gonna share it out via our networks. And I encourage everybody to share it through their networks as well. We, we need more bumps uh, for our show. So uh, Doug, thanks again, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, you. Thank thank you so everyone. much. No, this is awesome to be here and thank you for attending. Absolutely, and before we wrap, I would like to say that, uh, you know, back to that, um, that last question right before we talked about Verb, um, we talked a little bit about content um, customization and just data customization. We did an episode last week with David Jay, and there was a lot of conversation around that specifically, um, personalization versus customization. So anybody who did not get a chance to see that, please take a moment uh, to go back to our YouTube channel and watch that conversation. Um, and also next week, we're gonna be joined by Shannon Delaney. And uh, Shannon has been in the biz for a while. She's been from strategy on the e-com side. She's been on the agency side. Right now she's VP of marketing for DeNova, and she is the queen of scrappy marketing and uh, probably will wear a crown for that one. Uh, Shannon's fantastic. She's going to be an excellent guest. Um, I hope you guys can join us next week. And one more thing, um, as you're logging off, you're going to get a survey pop-up. Um, please let us know how we're doing. Let us know how we can improve the show. You know, this is for you guys. Uh, we want to make sure we're staying connected. We're asking all the right questions and we're doing this right. So please fill out that survey. Let us know how we're doing. Um, and if you have any guests that you'd like to see on the show, please let us know as well. So thanks yeah. again, Doug. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, Jen, thank you. My pleasure. For, for being so awesome and, and moderating for us. And, you know, you guys have a great weekend. And we look forward yeah. to seeing you again next week. Bye, everyone. Thank thanks, you. everybody. And, and Jen, send me any questions that were unanswered. I'm happy to follow I will up. do. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Bye, Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Bye. everybody.